So thanks. Okay. Thanks for joining everyone. We'll be letting people join as we go. So there'll be a few more people joining us, um, but we just wanted to get started on time. So welcome to the Coast to Coral online edition for anyone that hasn't been before. Before we proceed, I just wanted to make a brief acknowledgement of country and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today and the lands on which we live and work. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So of course, you're all here for tonight's online event, which is to listen to Eric's really awesome talk about lobsters and genomic methods. But before we get started um, and digging into his talk, I'm just going to give a brief overview, a brief check, what we do, and also highlight some of the really awesome events that we have coming up over the next couple of weeks and months. So who are we? We're essentially a not-for-profit citizen science organization, and we operate worldwide, but of course we're representing ReefCheck Australia, and in particular the sort of Southeast Queensland community. And we host a number of different events, such as beach cleanups, underwater cleanups. Um, we do a lot of community events like this Coast to Coral seminar series, as well as representing the organization at various events throughout the country. But as many of you will probably have heard, we are also um, really big in citizen science and we have our own Reef Check Australia Reef Health Survey method, um, where we do a lot of hands-on research and all that data um, is collected for long-term monitoring and it's all publicly available as well if you go to our website and the link is just down below on most of our slides. Just some housekeeping for tonight's event. So if you could keep your video and your mute on for the duration of Eric's portion of the talk. And then at the end, when we go into question time, you feel free, you're more than welcome um, to unmute or turn your video on at that stage. We'll also have um, the chat box will be um, checked by either Julie or myself throughout the night if you have any questions. Of course, if you have bigger questions about ReefCheck and our events, that's um, the main email address that um, you're directed to. So the SEQ surveys at ReefCheck Australia. And we'll also do a group photo later tonight once a few other people join us. So our upcoming events. We've got a seaway underwater cleanup. So that'll be on either February 26th or 27th at the Gold Coast Seaway. If you're interested in joining in on this event, keep your eye open for any of the social media details that will come out likely on Facebook and Instagram later this week. Of course, you do need to have some of the prerequisite um, dive qualifications to join in on this one. So if you're unsure about anything, just let us know. We also have Clean Up Australia Day, which is coming on up, which will be March the 3rd, and that's a weekend day. It'll be on Minjeriba, North Stradbroke Island, and this is going to be a really big and fun community event. There's going to be quite a few people joining in from various different organizations, so it's sure to be a lot of fun. And of course, many people will know that the Ocean Film Festival World Tour is on, so that'll be all across the country. Um, but in particular, in Southeast Queensland, it will be in Noosa and Brisbane, and that'll be across states in February and March. So if you're interested in attending, just head to their website to find out more. But we're also really interested in getting some Reef Check volunteers to join us because we'll be having some stalls um, at the event themselves. So that'll be likely on the 13th of March in Noosa and the 10th and 11th of April in Brisbane. So if you are interested in joining in at either of those stalls, please get in touch. We'll also have a cleanup at Talabudra again on the Gold Coast. That'll be on the 13th of April and we'll likely do both an in-water and land-based cleanup. So That'll be, you know, a bit, uh, many people will be able to join in on that, even if you don't have your dive qualification. So again, all those details will come up on our socials. A really exciting thing that we have coming up shortly will be our surveyor training. So if anyone out there is a keen diver and you have some of the prerequisites that I've listed, so the foremost one is having your rescue diver training. 
then by all means get in touch we're really keen to get some more surveyors trained so you'll be officially trained as a reef check reef health surveyor that's even recognized by paddy and that means that you'll be able to join us on all of our survey activities which is a really really incredible way to get involved so if you are interested in securing a spot please email that seq surveys email address and i can pop that in the chat as well if you've forgotten it so for next month's online event, we actually don't have a speaker organized. So many people that might be regulars for this Coast to Coral series will know that we used to host it monthly. At the moment, we're moving to a quarterly um, program. So we'll probably have another event in April and then two more events later in the year. But if you do know anyone that might be interested in presenting their research, you don't necessarily have to be a researcher. We sometimes get people who work in NGOs and education joining us as well. We're really just excited to hear about any sort of marine related uh, work that's going on um, locally, but also across the world as we'll be hearing about later tonight. So if you're keen to present or know anyone that you might want to nominate to present or even if you're interested in being a volunteer for the program and helping us host these events and promote them we're really keen to hear from you so let us know and of course if you can't make any of those events but you're still keen to volunteer please get in touch through socials. We're a really vibrant community. We have a lot of events that will be going on throughout the entire year, both during the week and on weekends. So please get in touch um, by any means. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, on all the socials. So you'll, you'll be sure to find us. And of course, um, before proceeding, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our incredible um, supporting organisations, as well as all of the incredible volunteers that help make all of our events possible. So thank you in particular to the people that help run the Coast to Coral seminar series. As I mentioned earlier, this could be you, so please get in touch. And so finally, on to tonight's speaker. So um, I'm really grateful that Eric said yes to join us tonight. So he and I actually did our undergraduate degrees together at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. And he um, majored in genetics and zoology, but he's now a master's student in Norway. So while we're experiencing heat waves, he's experiencing about minus 10 degrees. And he's doing some really interesting work at the New Norwegian University of Life Sciences in that sort of intersection of um, marine genomics and its application to conservation, which is what we're going to hear a lot about tonight. So his MSc research is really about facilitating the uptake of genetic tools in lobster monitoring in Norway. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Eric. And of course, if you have any questions at all, just pop them into the chat. All right. Thank you very much, Shelia, for that introduction. Let me just share my screen quickly. All right. So uh, again, thanks for that introduction. Thanks to uh, Reef Check Australia for, um, for hosting me. And to everyone in the, uh, the audience, thank you very much for listening in and a very good morning from, from Norway. Um, like Ilya said, my name is Eric and I'm looking forward to sharing my uh, talk Labs to Lobsters with you, which like Ilya alluded to, is, uh, is a talk about our work to promote the use of DNA tools in fisheries monitoring in Norway. I'd like to just give a quick disclaimer now at the start of the talk before we dig into it, that some of the research results we were hoping to present um, aren't quite ready yet. So instead, I've kind of reconceptualized this talk as, uh, as part research talk and, and part uh, background. So we'll be hearing about some of the work we do with a, a particular genetic tool in, in European lobster monitoring, and then a bit more about its, its general history and an application in other species as well, with some uh, examples that I hope you will find interesting. Now, Ilya already introduced me, but I'll just 
just briefly repeat that I'm a master's student in genomics right now, but I have a, a bachelor's in, in genetics and zoology from UQ, where I spent four years and also did my bachelor honors in population genetics with, um, under the supervision of Jan Engelstadter. So I'll be talking about my work today, but inevitably when I talk about my work, I'll also be talking about the work of these people uh, who might like to acknowledge right away. Uh, my supervisors, uh, Luis and Murray, for their invaluable mentorship and guidance, and my colleague, June, as well, uh, without whom nothing would ever get done in the lab. So I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all the members of the Saitu and Chavari labs for their feedback that made this talk so much better than it, than it was before. And I'd also like to acknowledge the, the many other colleagues and helpers at the university that are involved with our work or whose work we are involved with. Uh, science really is, is not a one man show and that's, uh, and that's very true for the work that we do as well. So a final note uh, on introductions just to uh, give you an idea of where it is we work, if you have a look at the map of Northern Europe and then zoom in on the southeast coast of Norway, you will find the Oslo Fjord. It's nearby the Norwegian University of Life Sciences where we work and our fieldwork site uh, is located at the narrowest point of, uh, of the Oslo Fjord, which connects the, the Northern Atlantic to the very doorstep of our capital city, Oslo. So with the introductions aside, I'd like to begin this talk by describing the background for our work. Uh, and to do that, we need to explore a lobster monitoring program with a bit of a, of a problem. So when I say, say lobster, I invariably refer to, uh, to the European lobster. And this is, a, in Norway, a very cherished lobster species. It's a very long-lived decapod crustacean. Like other large decapods, it, it can have very varied interactions with the rest of its uh, ecosystem, serving different roles under different conditions. And undeniably, part of the reason why it is cherished in Norway is because it uh, forms the basis for a very culturally important fishery. It is a high value luxury seafood. And it's also a high value luxury seafood that forms the basis of a very important recreational fishery. A lot of people uh, every year look forward to, to November and October because that's the, the annual lobstering season. Unfortunately though, it's also a threatened lobster species. It's been categorized as vulnerable in Norway since 2021. That's primarily due to one single threat, and that is harvest pressure from the fishery. Uh, and, and the primary reason for its categorization as vulnerable is population decline from, from fishery. Even if there are multiple regulations in place, they have not been able to, they have not been able to prevent that decline. And unfortunately, it is also likely still declining uh, despite the uh, categorization as vulnerable. Part of the reason for this is probably technological creep, which exacerbates the issue. Um, technological creep and refers to the fact that despite the, the lobster population declining, the people who, who fish for lobster uh, get ever better equipment so the, the perceived abundance of lobster doesn't necessarily decrease. This means that harvests remain high even if the population declines and it also makes it more difficult to, to communicate about effective management. So despite regulations that are in place like this restricted annual lobstering season, um, there's still no real sign of of national recovery, except locally in sanctuaries. So in our fieldwork site, which I pointed 
to you on the on the map earlier. There's actually a new sanctuary for lobsters, and it happens to be Norway's smallest. It's it's in the Drabak Strait, so the narrowest point of the Oslo Fjord. And it's part of a, of a greater network of, of sanctuaries and protected areas all around the southeastern coast of Norway, also moving into the west coast of Sweden. And in these sanctuaries, all the use of lobstering equipment is banned. So in principle, there's no way you can legally catch a lobster there. Similar measures to this have been successful in the past. So we expect that lobster abundance will increase here and we expect that we will have restoration of demographic structure. And these are these are positives that we that we hope to see over time in, in this sanctuary. So the question remains though whether this, the smallest sanctuary for lobsters in Norway, is too small to be effective. And colleagues of ours at NMBU in 2020, before the sanctuary was established, realized that this was an opportunity to start a monitoring program. So the good news then is of course that we monitor the sanctuary and we have been since 2020. I have a, I have a video here that I'd like to show to you which describes quite well what it is that program uh, or that, that field work looks like and the, the monitoring work itself. So I'll just spin that video. I removed the sound so I can give some commentary as we, as we go. So you can see that here we, we tag the lobsters, so we have recapture records for them. This helps us get estimates of uh, abundance and survival. And we also collect these genetic samples, which will be important later. As the video states, the goal of course is to get more sustainable management of lobster populations. And the data and samples that we collect during field work help us do that by allowing us to estimate the change in abundance of the lobster population, uh, whether it's uh, survival profile changes. And as you'll hear more about later, there are uses for these DNA samples as well. So this is the good thing that we, we are keeping eyes on this small sanctuary. The bad thing is that we have very limited demographic data. And that could be in breach of the, of the 10 commandments of ecosystem-based uh, fishery science, as a, a paper back in 2007 sort of humorously put it. Because one of those very important aspects or important things of fisheries management is to maintain the age structure of the, of the population, especially the older animals. And having age data is vital for understanding whether we do that. It's also vital for understanding population dynamics like the relationship between recruitment and mortality, the stability of recruitment, and to have age is also a very useful reference for selection on traits like growth and like size at age. And all of these things are things that we would be very interested in knowing to assess how well the sanctuary is actually working. And now there are methods that we could use uh, to age lobsters. Unfortunately, the traditional ones are laborious, inaccurate, and or lethal. Uh, an interesting example that I'm displaying on the slide here is, is a method that lets you age lobsters by essentially cutting off their eyes and, and examining their insides. That's not really viable in a, in a sanctuary setting, although it, it might be in a commercial one. Another thing that you could conceivably do to, to get an idea of age structure in your population is to use size as an age proxy. But again, that's not a viable solution uh, because the relationship between age and size in the European lobster is, is hardly predictive at all. Uh, the authors of the study that you're seeing on the slide right now to paraphrase them, they, they said that it's, it's so poor as to be virtually meaningless. 
So we're left with uh, left with the issue then that we want age data, but we don't have it. We have DNA samples though, so can we use the DNA-based tool to solve these problems? And that'll be the, the topic for the rest of the talk. And that brings us to the topic of the, of the next section where we discuss in slightly broader terms, the kind of DNA aging tools uh, that we think might be a, a suitable solution for our monitoring program. And we'll explore the, the history and uses of these tools kind of from their origins in the labs to the kind of applications we envision in lobsters. So for a bit of background, the, the focus will be on a particular kind of DNA aging tool called an epigenetic clock or epigenetic clocks. The proof of concept for this was published in a paper in 2011. And in it, the authors use saliva samples from humans, humans of known ages. And based on features of the DNA in these saliva samples, which we'll be exploring in the next slide, they can predict the age of these study participants to a precision of roughly five years, which perhaps doesn't sound very impressive at face value, but this was a proof of concept. And in some applications, that might have actually been a very valuable practical tool. Now, the way that this approach roughly works by finding relationships between something called DNA methylation and age. And we'll explore here what this means. So if we kind of imagine we unwind uh, a double-stranded helix of DNA and we, we look at the, the single strand of, of nucleotides, A's and T's and C's and G's, you can see that there are particular sites on the DNA that can have what's called an epigenetic modification to them. And this epigenetic modification, so uh, a modification that's made to the physical structure of the molecule itself, not to the information it contains. This epigenetic modification is what's called methylation because it adds the CH3 or, or methyl group. And this is dynamic. It's, it's not all or nothing. It can change throughout the lifetime of a cell throughout the lifetime of, of an organism. And so in that sense, we can, we can really think of this as a light switch, as an on off So here we have three light switches and they can change again, back and forth, dynamic over the lifetime of a cell or an organism. And because we have many copies of our DNA, two in one cell and, and millions of cells represented here as only five for simplicity, the, the real sort of state of these light switches isn't binary, even if a single light switch is, each site is actually represented by many copies. So these are better represented as frequencies. And the idea with an epigenetic clock is to represent the relationship between age and DNA in terms of the changing frequencies of these methylated sites, these light switch sites. So we can imagine here that we have a bunch of individuals of known age. And we look at the relationship between these light switch sites and age over time. So at age two, the pattern would be like this, at age three, like this, and age four, like this. And you can see here that there's a, a trend in, in two of these light switches over time. And to simplify the statistical process for selecting this kind of stuff a whole lot, we can then say that these are clock sites. These are sites that have a, a clock-like nature and that age is related to them. In real life, these sites are selected using machine learning because you can have data on millions of these sites across the entire uh, genome. And then you need a machine learning approach to select the sites that are most informative while also avoiding selecting too many. 
And uh, the genius of these early studies on epigenetic clocks is to realize that they could do this kind of thing. And, and that has really become the template for doing the same thing over time and in, in later years. And since 2011, since that first proof of concept, there's really been developed a great diversity of epigenetic clocks. This is just a few examples, and I've included specifically the loblolly pine, just to illustrate that this isn't only limited to animals. It's, it's particularly interesting, actually, that the plants are represented among these epigenetic clocks as well, because plants can have methylation at different sites than just the sites that, that animals have, and still they can be used to produce epigenetic clocks. And one thing that's interesting to note is that while you can develop an epigenetic clock from scratch by looking across the entire genome of the species for these clock sites and selecting the best ones. You can also take inspiration from studies that have already been done in species that are related to the species that you're interested in. And researchers in Tasmania did this in 2014 in a paper where they use information about what clock sites are informative of age in humans to target a particular region uh, that's similar in the genome of the humpback whale. And that let them create an epigenetic clock for whales, uh, specifically for the humpback whale, although there are other whales that have epigenetic clocks too. And that's very useful for conservation given that the humpback is otherwise very difficult to age. Similarly, a few years later in 2021, uh, a team out of Queensland published a study where they used information from the zebra fish to guide their selection of DNA regions for looking for these epigenetic clocks, uh, or sorry, epigenetic clock sites in threatened Australian fishes, uh, including the Australian lungfish and the Murray cod. They did the same thing a couple of years later for the golden perch another threatened uh, species, at least locally. And I've included just a figure from their paper here to, to illustrate the, the good performance of this kind of epigenetic clock, especially now in later years. You can see that the relationship between the known age and the DNA age, the age that they, they estimate, is, is very, very good. All of the points basically fall around that central diagonal. So we've seen that epigenetic clocks can be made from scratch by searching the entire genome for these informative clock sites that are good at predicting age in an animal or in a plant. We've seen that epigenetic clocks can be shared between species, that you can take inspiration from what genes or regions of the genome are relevant for aging in a zebra fish, and you can apply that in, in other fishes, for instance. So there are some researchers that ask themselves how far these genetic clocks can be shared, how much biodiversity can you cover with, with a single region of the genome. And this led to the publishing of another important proof of concept paper in 2019, where researchers find kind of the quote unquote, most shared epigenetic clock by looking at the part of the genome that's the most shared in the most species, which is called the ribosomal DNA. And it happens to also be kind of mechanistically linked to aging. And they found that by looking at only this part of the genome, quite a, a small part of our total DNA, they can make an epigenetic clock that can work in several species, and better yet, you can actually, at least for some species, make an epigenetic clock for one species and simply use it for another. So it's not the kind of inspiration we saw with the zebra fish and the golden perch earlier. It's more like ripping off the other species' homework and just using the exact same clock signs. And while that's rather remarkable, it's obviously a relatively new paper still. And I'm not sure there are a lot of studies that have sort of availed themselves of the opportunity to use, use this, but it does unlock 
the potential for using these epigenetic clocks in, in more non-model species where you have fewer genomic resources. And very luckily for me and my colleagues at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, a team in the UK decided that they would use this for an invertebrate that we're kind of interested in. So they used this, this conserved ribosomal DNA. They targeted that region from that proof of concept paper. And they found some clock sites that they can use to very accurately and precisely age European lobsters based on DNA samples. Now, this study was, was published by researchers at the University of East Anglia under the leadership of, of Eleanor Fairfield. And what they did was, was really quite elegant in that they, they reached out to a, a lobster hatchery so that they could actually rear lobsters from ages zero to 50 months and then use lobsters of, of known age across that entire age range to train their model with. And, uh, and that's why I've illustrated this slide with a, with a photo of a very small lobsters because they, because they went to a hatchery for their age reference. So this is a good point or a good place in the talk to, to stop for a second and take stock of the story so far and ask the question again if we can improve lobster monitoring with, with DNA aging. Because we want age data and we have DNA. And we know now that we can age lobsters with that DNA with uh, an established method that has excellent accuracy and precision. So it looks pretty promising so far. And that leads into the next part of this talk where we discuss what it is that my colleagues at NMU and I do to try and facilitate the practical uptake of this tool in local lobster monitoring. Because there is one challenge that remains. And that is that the, the lobster epigenetic clock, the one that Fairfield and colleagues developed, it needs more testing. They validated this approach for young lobsters, like I just mentioned, zero to 50 months. So for that age range, we have very good confidence that their model would give us good predictions of age. To take a hypothetical lobster here on the plot to the left, if a lobster was of real age four years, then we would expect that Fairfield et al's model would predict that model, uh, predict that lobster, sorry, to be four years as well. And the reason for that, of course, is that they built this model on all of that data from these young lobsters. And in that age range, the relationship between age and DNA age is supported by a lot of data. The issue is that lobsters can live a very long time. I mentioned in one of the introductory slides that a male can be 40 years and a female can live to 70. So we need confidence in predictions well over four years of age if we're gonna use this for lobster monitoring and to understand the age structure of the population in the sanctuary that we monitor. And the thing is, right now, if we want to make predictions beyond that supported by data, it's, it's basically inference. And it's possible that the features of DNA, these light switch sites, uh, the, the clock sites, that are supported by data in lobsters of zero to four years of age, it's, it's possible that they behave similarly in older lobsters too, and that this relationship holds. But we don't know that, and it's possible that the relationship will also look different, that these clock sites will, will not reflect the aging process well beyond four years of age. And that could go in either, you know, either direction up or down. 
it might be the case also that after 40 years of age, lobsters, uh, lobsters that are really older will wind up all ending up with the same predicted age. Now, we could deal with this, of course, by having more training data, having, having more data to support the model itself, having older lobsters to include in the data that the model is based on. But knowing the real age for a very old lobster is difficult. If you were going to do it like Fairfield and colleagues, then your study would outlive your scientific career because you can't rear a lobster to age 50 just to know its age to train an aging model. And the other alternatives aren't necessarily all that effective because you can't necessarily rely on sort of releasing lobsters into the wild and hoping to recapture them 25 years later because there are many sources of mortality in the wild that might prevent that from happening. And so your chances of getting the data you need if you do something like that are quite low. So what we need is another way to test whether the inference of their model holds, at least if we're going to be able to use it for monitoring our lobsters in the wild. So one thing that we've been considering is that perhaps in order to check if the model generalizes well, we don't actually need to test its predictions of age, just its predictions of change in age. Because inevitably every year, every one ages by one year, and that includes all lobsters. So the predicted DNA age should increase by a single year for each real year. And so if we consider another hypothetical lobster that we might have encountered in 2020, for instance, if we encounter that same lobster again last year, then it should have hypothetically aged by three years. And the predictions that we then get out of an aging model should give us that same interval. For the same lobster, three years later, we want the predictions to be three years apart and that age slope to be of a single year for each year that passes in real time. And then that should be consistent as well over most predicted DNA ages, right? So we want to cover much of that vertical axis and see that across different estimated ages, the slope still holds. And this we could conceivably test, right? Better yet, we have the benefit of running a long-term study. So we can actually repeat sample the same lobster again and again. Uh, I've numbered these hypothetical lobsters one to eight, but the, the little subscripts might as well be tag numbers that we actually give them in the field. And just to remind you what we actually do, we, we catch register and tag lobsters, and there's nothing stopping us from simply repeating this process and then taking another tissue sample that we can use to age the lobster twice, instead of having to rely on knowing the absolute age on lobsters that we sort of support the Fairfield model with. And this is what we're doing. So I'll show you now briefly the samples that we have been fortunate to, to get in the field. You can't, can't always sort of order the samples you want when you work with wild animals, but we've been very lucky to actually get samples that seem suitable for the stuff we want to do. Uh, so we got a lot of recaptures when we did our field work in December of 2023, so last year. And we have 48 recaptured samples, or 48 recaptured lobsters, each with two samples that we're gonna try and perform this, this test of the Fairfield aging uh, tool with. The sex ratio of those lobsters is balanced, so we can account for any difference that might pop up between the sexes in, in how they're aged. And we have also a range of recapture intervals. The, the greatest interval was actually of 36 months. So we did recapture a lobster 
from 2020 in 2023, much like that hypothetical lobster one from the, from the previous slide. This also means that we could be able to account for bias from any potential environmental effects because these light switches, the, the methylation sites, the, the clock sites, they can be affected by the environment. Um, but the nice thing about them, at least if you're trying to age a lobster with them, is that these environmental effects tend to be reversible. So by having sort of a broad capture of different, different years and having these intervals also spread across different years, uh, we can we can hope that there's no strong bias that's introduced by a particular uh, environmental happening in one year, for instance. And then finally, we also have a very broad coverage of size in these samples, uh, which again allows us to account for any difference that that size might introduce in the age predictions. And it's also our best guess, kind of thing, including a broad range of ages, though. So, like I said earlier, the relationship between size and age is, is a bit of a mess in, in the European lobster. But still, we, we have a coverage of, of size from roughly 19 to 20 centimeters up to 35 to 36, which covers most of the, the natural range that we encounter in the wild. So as I alluded to earlier, we haven't yet um, received the final results from the uh, from the analysis. So we're working basically on on getting these methylation data from these samples right now. We're awaiting that result from our analysis supplier. But we can say something about our expectations and some potential results and, and how we might interpret that. If the model is accurate, we will get the same kind of relationship like we saw a couple of slides ago where the age slope is always constant, uh, no matter the age of the lobster and uh, the size of the interval. This is kind of what we want. If the Fairfield model generalizes well, this is what we ought to see. And, and if this is the outcome, that would be very convenient for us because that would mean that the, the tool, the DNA tool that Fairfield et al made for aging lobsters would be and ready for use and monitoring. We just need to upscale it. Alternatively, we could find that the aging tool underestimates the age of older lobsters and that the, the slope decreases for greater ages. This is one possibility. And alternatively, you could see the opposite thing happening that the aging process seems to accelerate according to, to the model as age increases. I think the most likely outcome is probably something like B. Uh, Fairfield that I'll mention this in their original paper, but there's a chance that some of the, the clock sites, these epigenetic light switches might saturate so that they are all on basically after a given amount of years. And when that begins happening, that site can't provide any information to, to predict a greater age anymore. And if that happens to enough sites and enough sites end up not changing because they're already one or at a, at a frequency of one, for, for the on state or the off state, then the predicted age won't change even as the real age does. And so I think some level of, of B is maybe inevitable, but the question of course is how old the lobsters actually can become before this starts to be a problem. If it's only a problem for lobsters aged you know, 40, 50, then maybe it's not a big deal for, for practical monitoring. And this leads us uh, to my last slide where I'll just mention briefly some of the future directions we have in mind for this work. We're currently working with 48 lobsters, right? 96 samples like I 
action, then this is very much the testing stage. We want to see if Fairfield and colleagues model generalize as well. If it does, we want to upscale it. We want to work at our in-house lab facility at the, the Center for Integrative Genetics at NMBU to make a cost-effective and, and relatively simple method for doing this for many lobsters. It's possible we could we could even benefit there from, from cutting a few corners and maybe sacrificing some accuracy for scale. Um, that's something we could we could consider if we find that it works because the, the model is already very accurate. And then the goal then is to do this for hundreds and hundreds of lobsters and get proper estimates of demographics so we can have an understanding of the relationship between recruitment and mortality. We can have an understanding of whether fisheries or the, the fishery influences uh, or, or selects on traits like science that age and growth. And ultimately, the goal of that, of course, is to empower sustainable management for the European lobster. And I hope that this is also kind of illustrative of potential uses for this kind of technology also in other species. So with all that said, thank you all very, very much for your, for your attention. And thanks again to Reach Check Australia for hosting, hosting my talk today. If you have any questions, I'd be, be very happy to answer them as best I can. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. That was awesome. Um, we do have a few questions already in the chat. So the first one is, is the clock being reset for regenerating tissue? Almost started answering the question on mute there. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. For regenerating tissue, we don't actually know. So we We've accounted for that by sampling the second sample from a different location. We take these genetic samples from the Europod, uh, the, the tail fan, and they have four of them. So whenever we resample tissue for this work, we, we take a different Europod so that we know that it hasn't been regenerated tissue. It would be very interesting to know whether regrowing tissue resets an epigenetic clock like this. And alternatively, be very interesting to know if you can train a clock that doesn't reset or one that does deliberately. That's a great question. I, I don't think there's really a good answer yet. Cool. And um, so we've got a few from Gabby. The first one, what does it mean that environmental factors can be reversed? What about temperature? Is climate change going to change these site signals through the years, making the age estimation unreliable? That's a good question. Uh, it definitely touches on some of the considerations that we have to make, right? Because stress can influence epigenetics. Um, and it's in particular that kind of thing that we want to make sure doesn't affect our, our work. The thing is, though, that stress is sort of inherently irreversible unless it's completely constant. I suppose if it became completely constant, then the, the aging models you train will kind of include that, that increased rate of of methylation, for instance, or a decreased rate of methylation from the stress, if it becomes so constant that it's that it's always there. Um, but that would probably also kind of interact with phenotypic plasticity in the species itself. That's it's a difficult question to answer how how climate change is going to affect this kind of thing. But it's it's especially the kind of the irregular effects that could have. Uh, a, a troublesome effect on our ability to estimate age accurately, more so than perhaps constant effects, because they would eventually be uh, be captured by the, the models when you train them with new data. The problem, of course, with climate change is that things no longer remain regular. So it could definitely be uh, be an interesting thing to look into. And I think there is a lot of research that looks into the 
epigenetic effects of, of this kind of climate variability. Yeah, great. Yes. Oh, yeah, go for it. Go. You're, you're welcome to ask the question directly if you want. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, the other part of the question was whether there is any knowledge on uh, um, whether there is an interaction between environmental factors like temperature, um, fixating on that one, and uh, uh, this epigenetic signal and uh, an age on this epigenetic signal. So, say um, I wrote an example like, does temperature affect these epigenetic signals in different ways? For example, for older um older uh animals where maybe the temperature doesn't change much the, the epigenetic tags uh compared to younger animals i don't know if that makes sense no that makes sense that's that's a really good question i think that would end up also interacting with what i spoke about earlier with with the saturation of these epigenetic sites too right uh if that's one thing that I imagine might lead to something like what you say is sort of a different a different influence of, of climate or temperature stress on older versus younger lobsters. Uh, but again, I, I have to default to the answer that I'm, I'm not actually sure how in the long term climate change and, and changing temperatures are going to affect these kinds of clocks. Uh, what we do know is that the short term uh, short term stresses and variable uh, variable influences on on the animals can lead to changes. But so far, the good thing about these clocks is that they are reversible and they aren't as susceptible to environmental effects as some other uh, sort of putative DNA aging pools that haven't worked as well as these epigenetic clubs. There's probably also an element of kind of, of how central these epigenetic mechanisms are to the actual biology of the organism. They're one of the reasons they probably work well is that they are maybe also intrinsically linked to the aging process. So it's central to the biology of the species. Uh, so, so maybe they're under selective pressure to be maintained as well. But they're all very good questions. I don't have any conclusive answers. Great, do we have any other questions for Eric? There's not many of us, so feel free to turn your mics on or just pop them in the chat. <clears throat> cool, looks like it's gone quiet. Well, if anyone wants to get in touch with Eric, I'm sure you can um, find him online. And we'll also have this um, up on our YouTube website. So if there's any bits you missed or if you want to share it with friends, that'll all go up onto our Reef Check Australia YouTube later in the week. And just as a reminder, if anyone wants to get involved with the seminar series or talk, um, please get in touch via email. We're really keen to get the program up and running again. Um, but with that, I'll let everyone head to dinner if you're on this side of the world in Australia or maybe a late breakfast if you're in Norway. But thank you, Eric, for joining us, um, especially given the time difference. I'm sure everyone will agree that it was a really interesting talk. So thank you. Thanks, Wally, for listening. In. My Great. pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.